Welcome back to Music Therapy and Beyond. My name is Alyssa, and for today's clinical segment, we have a very special guest to talk about heartbeat songs and music therapy. Today, we're sitting down with Brian Schreck, who is a pioneer in the music therapy field for his work specifically with heartbeat recordings and heartbeat songs in music therapy. This is a modality where music therapists record an individual's heartbeat and use it as a rhythm for a song or for many other applications, as we will talk about in this episode. This is a topic very close to my heart, no pun intended. Heartbeat music therapy is the focus of my graduate thesis project, and I first became passionate about heartbeat music therapy during my clinical internship as I helped to establish the Heartbeat Song Program at Tallahassee Memorial Hospital. As I've continued to study this approach, prepared educational resources on how to practice this, and also benefited personally from heartbeat songs of loved ones, I've learned so much from being both the clinician and the recipient. Let's get to know a little bit about Brian before we bring him on. Brian Schreck, MA, MTBC, is a board-certified music therapist who has been serving the chronically ill since 2004. Brian has a Bachelor's of Arts in Music Therapy from Berklee College of Music and a Master's of Arts in Music Therapy from New York University. Brian has served on the Board of Directors, as well as the Executive Committee of the International Association for Music and Medicine. Palliative care, end-of-life care, and bereavement are areas of passion for Mr. Shrek. Brian has presented locally, nationally, and internationally on his innovative work in medical music therapy. Shrek pioneered the use of heartbeat recordings as a way to rhythmically connect with patients and their families through ongoing recording projects called Amplified Cardiopulmonary Recordings, or ACPR. This rhythmic stem cell is something that can be worked on, changed, and transformed into music forever. Visit www.amplifiedcpr.org for more information on that work. Brian Schreck's main aim as a medical music therapist is to be as creative as possible to serve the needs of the patients he serves, as well as their families. Brian Schreck facilitates ongoing in- and outpatient music therapy with people with a diagnosis of cancer through the Norton Cancer Institute. The conversation that we're going to have is so rich and inspiring, and I am thrilled to have him here to share with us about his work and experiences. Without further ado, let's get into the conversation. Good morning, Brian. It is so wonderful to have you with us. How are you today? It's wonderful to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So just to kind of um, introduce yourself and get us going, I would love to hear a little bit of the background of how we got here today. What is your clinical background? How did you get into music therapy and how did we get here? Well, let's start from the tip top, very beginning. Um, When I was a little boy, my mom um, delivered communion in a nursing home and when I was around nine I would follow her around and I was learning how to play the saxophone and she would see that I would be getting bored every now and then so she would say why don't you go play in the day room and just see what happens like you need to go practice anyway it'll just you know it'll make them feel good it'll make you feel good and I, I remember seeing things happen like eyes widening and surprise looks of of joy and one time an uh, old gentleman stood up and started to dance and then he grabbed a, another lady in a wheelchair and started to kind of wiggle her around. And I was like, something is happening right now and I don't really know what it is, but I know I like it. I know I'm, I want to be a musician. So I think, um, I think as a little person, I got to see kind of immediate results of how music can move people. Um, so after that, um, I, I looked into it and when I finished high school, I played in, the marching band and the jazz band and the, um, the concert uh, ensemble. So I was, I was very still, you know, I was taking lessons, you know, and practicing daily. And I, I knew that I was going to be a musician. So I, I was looking at music schools. Berkeley College of Music was always this kind of a big dream. Um, and then I got in and I, I 
realized that music therapy was a major there. Um, so I did one semester of film scoring, and then I realized that I didn't want to be by myself in a room. I needed people. Um, so I, I kind of went back to my roots of, you know, the beginning of the nursing home. And uh, I, I enrolled in the music therapy program. And ever since then, I've just been on this this wild ride of, you know, trying to, to make magic happen no matter where I am, just like any, any musician that wants to be great at whatever they're doing, um, trying to push the limits and help people the whole time. So um, I get inspired by a lot of people, a lot of young people like you that are in the field, you know, taking it to the next level. So I feel like, you know, this, our field is continuing to, to move, um, which I'm, I'm always proud to be a part of. I'm so after Berkeley, good. I went to New York University. I got to spend a whole year with Clive Robbins. I didn't officially enroll in the Nordoff Robbins um, curriculum, but at that time, he offered a, a year-long class for people that just wanted kind of a peripheral one-on-one -on -one with him almost. So the, it was a very small class with five or six people, and Clive kind of got to tell his life story and wow. how he got to where he was. So that, that really meant the world to me because that, that was one of my main reasons for, for coming to New York other than Joy and Lowy. Um, and it was just a dream come true to, to be in the same room with, with someone that you know was one of the first people that I learned about in music therapy. And, an icon almost in our icon. field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what always struck me about him was his it was obvious to see how much he loved these people he was working with and his ability and patience to be with them for years and years and years, I think really created a foundation of my clinical approach, which is more long-term relationship based um, clinical love that you get to share with someone and really see the, the, the wonderment that can happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I definitely see that in the brief conversation that we had prior to this and obviously in your work. Now, speaking of your work, I know you do a lot of different things, um, but one thing in particular that many music therapists may recognize you from or have heard about uh, in your news stories and articles and all of that, um, if you could just tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing with Heartbeat Music Therapy, what is it? What is it about? And how did you get into that? So, you know, going back to Clive a little bit about recording. So I, I like to record as much as possible. And I did this early on in my career. Um, so trying to, to capture and preserve all the good parts of life. So getting a laugh, getting someone saying, I love you, whether they're a pediatric patient or, you know, 101 years old. Um, to me, it was always important to make legacy a priority. And it, even if everything worked out awesome and you're cured or you, you know, you're on your, well, your way back to well health and well-being health, um, I felt like it was still important part to, to document that piece of their, their puzzle um, for their reflection if they, they so wanted to, to reflect upon. So I recorded lots of things, whether it was just parts of sessions, people singing songs, um, the medical equipment in their room to make some sort of, you know, sound collage out of to create a piece of music with, um, sampling parts of their life that you could use to build, you know, a, a kind of a, a unique piece of music with. But it was always individualized. It was always about them. And once I started working in intensive care, it, there was a lot of things that you wouldn't want to remember. So there, there weren't a lot of moments that you would want to record or reflect upon later. To me, the, those are times that were probably the most challenging for the caregivers and the patients that they were loving that whole time. So after time went on, you know, we were doing so much music geared towards them and for them and even with them because we were using parts of their room to truly to really just sort of celebrate their life and 
it wasn't until I, I talked to quite a few people. I mean, it's, it's kind of a snowball thing that happened as all of us should be doing in our careers of picking up the pieces from all parts of our musical life and our colleagues that are, can inspire you with even just clinical conversations. So there's about three things that happened all at once. I was getting bored in intensive care which when you're bored, your imagination starts to run a little bit. The heart monitors are always in your faces in intensive cares. Um, on top of that, I was having conversations with uh, musicians about just how can we create rhythms out of anything that's going on. So Milford Graves is a jazz musician and a professor that would study heart rhythms so that he could better understand his drum playing. So I would talk about that with one of my, my next door neighbors at Berkeley named Matt Mangano, who plays the bass. So we're always talking about like that dance between rhythm and bass and the pocket and groove and creating things that feel good. Um, so that's kind of in my back pocket and on the back burner. I was talking to one of our first colleagues at Cincinnati Children's and she would, she was talking about one of her, um, her colleagues, Kara Davis, who worked in Cleveland, uh, they did their internship with the Four Lane way back when. And she would work with women that had multiple losses during birth. So high risk pregnancies. And as a way for them to bond, she would write lullabies with the moms and in the background, put the ultrasound sounds just to to sort of bring it back to why we're doing this in the first place which right. is to connect with your baby so to me that was like another you know light bulb and a buzz of neon that's going on and then i saw um a, i think it was on good morning america it was a story about tara storch and her family going on a skiing trip one of the worst things that could ever happen their daughter was in an accident on one of the slopes unfortunately passed away but was an organ donor and the recipient of her heart and Tara, the mom connected about a year later and she listened to her daughter's heart still beating in this woman. And the look on her face was another light bulb. It was like, so I think the heartbeat can be a sound that should be represented somehow in some of these recordings when it's appropriate. And thinking of just like a metronome or any sort of other rhythmic based thing, it, it just is so simple and so powerful. Yeah. And to me, at the bottom of it is just another way for them to say, I love you. So it was mm. almost in my mind, bringing these people in in sense of care, it was giving them a voice to say, I love you back to their family. Wow. So that Chills. was kind of my main <laughs> That was some of my main approach in the beginning. And then that led to my work in pediatric hospice, which an arm of that was um, neonatal and um, perinatal hospice, sorry, perinatal hospice. So I would work with women that were expecting babies that weren't expected to live or survive much long after birth. So recording their ultrasounds, going back to Kara Davis and Catherine Yeager, Bruno, about, you know, how can we connect and use this, this time to bond uh, when things feel so scary? And at the same time, it was a way for me to accompany them on their OB uh, appointments, where for most people in the waiting room, you know, they're excited. They're having moments of like excitement and joy and celebration, how big they're getting and, you know, how, how many, you know, measuring their bellies and, right. and then a hidden feeling that these women experienced that was not out loud of, of fear and grief and worry. And I could advocate for them while I was with them. So you know, I could, while we were waiting in the waiting room, I could go talk to the nurse and say, do you know why I'm here for this reason to record the ultrasound for this reason? And also advocate for specifically things that the mom may want, which would be either to have a very normal one, like a normal exam, just like you do for any other person in her situation, or to do kind of a hybrid, you know, shortened version of it just because they didn't want all of that. So it was very specific to them. 
but I felt there was a change in the air with how, you know, how they interacted with the patient as well mm. as an extra la- layer of support also to bring it back. Cause this is still kind of unusual that this is happening. Right. Um, and it made them, I feel like act more loving and caring towards this person who needed actually a lot more support than these other patients. Right. And more advocacy. Mm. Exactly. So, yeah, I could be a champion uh, for them as well as preserve this special moment, which might be the only sound of life that we heard. So, again, it was another way for that little person to let the world know that they exist. And then on top of that, to say that I love you to their parents. Mm, Yeah. And to their other siblings, too, because, you know, if if they didn't come home from the hospital, you know, if the mom delivered and then they came home just with the parents again, you know, to explain even to, um, you know, a a young person all the way up to even a school age person that this is your little brother or sister's heartbeat. And this is another way for them to say, I love you. And it's a part of their story now too. And it makes sense. You know, it's not super abstract, you know, at the bottom of it, it's just, um, you know, home is where the heart is. Mm, Yeah. And I'm thinking too, just how, um, affirming and validating for the mother and and the parents too of like having a a permanent way to remember like this was my baby this was a real thing this happened this was important to us and will always be significant it's not something to just be forgotten about or set to the side you know and through I would just imagine through the grieving journey and through life that would be just such a powerful um, signifier of what of what was and what will continue to be in their life. And I'm glad that you bring up bereavement because this can be a tool to use as a clinical thread to continue to work upon in bereavement. Mm. So it can start out as a little piece of music that's meaningful in this time presently, but you can also reaccess it and continue to add to it over you know the work that you would do with them if they wanted to absolutely so to me it can be a very interesting way to reconnect to continue to bond um to feel like you're still working with them in a way um that their love is still around and that it's still alive even yeah and to me that's a positive way to approach some of the grief work that we can do versus always focusing on dying and death. This is focusing on living in life Mm. and also continuing to move. Right. So I feel like when we do have profound and complicated grief, we feel stuck. So in my mind, I'm using this modality or intervention and it's a process based intervention. It's not meant to be a static one time piece of music that a music therapist works on in their own solitude, at their own office. It should be with as much involvement and participation with the people that this is intended for so that it's their recording. It's not our recording. And that's often why I don't use my own voice. I do whatever I can to get other people, especially if it's the patient that we can do, because I work with adults now. So if I can get the patient singing over their own heartbeat, or reciting a poem or a story about how they love the person that it's intended for. To me, that's way, way different than almost a performance by their music therapist. Mm. And it's meant to be done in little pieces of time, not so it, it, it's okay if it's never finished, you know, yeah. it's, it's meant to continue to follow them wherever they are. Which is completely parallel to grief. It's never done. There's never fully closure. It is always a journey. Exactly. Yeah. So this can be a lifeline, in my opinion, to continue to work with the intention that you're going to use it into bereavement. So that's why I've I've sort of refreshed the name of it to call it Amplified Cardiopulmonary Recordings with an S at the end so that you can continue to work with it. It's not just a one-time, what I think a lot of music therapists use it as, as a heartbeat recording, that they'll either add a layer of guitar or piano and then a layer of voice on top. 
to a meaningful song that's usually chosen mostly in pediatrics by I'm assuming their parents. And that's, that's nice. That's a nice way to use it. Um, to me, that's more of a gift versus a process-based intervention that you really help facilitate a way for them to work with it. Because the more that involved that they're in with it, I feel like the more ownership they have for it, as well as the more they could use it. And that's the therapy the piece, might... right? That's exactly. where like the music therapy part comes into play. Right. And it's with as much talking around all of this as well. And to me, that's when you can open up stories about their life and things that they can reaccess that are things that can be positive in their grief experience. But again, going back to moving, we're using this heartbeat to continue to keep on moving our feet, one foot in front of the other, getting out and moving, celebrating their life not feeling stuck and overwhelmed just by the existence of it. So I think some people that do it at the very end of life without much relationship, it can get lost in a shuffle. So I sent you a, a recent brief report I did uh, that was published in the journal of palliative medicine that I think will be officially out in September, but I gave you a preview copy, which sort of outlines the work that I'm currently doing here at the Norton Cancer Institute with adults with cancer. Yeah. So using this work and seeing how much the people use it after the death of these people. And what I found is that half of them listen to it more than once. 30% listen to it at least once. So in my opinion, it's moderately, you know, accessible and used if we're going to put those numbers together to make 80% use. But I feel like the ones that weren't in that, that never listened to it, some of them didn't remember doing it because it was in the chaos of their loved one's last days, sometimes last day of life. Mm -hmm. So without that time to work with them and other, other being <clears throat> introduced by another healthcare professional, professional like in the intensive care unit saying, Oh, that there's, there's this opportunity. Do you want this? And they would often say yes. And to me, that's not the best way to introduce this to someone. It should be introduced by us. Like if someone else in our health system, healthcare system knows about it and wants their patients to have it, I'm, I think it's wonderful that they think about it. And then I want them to call me so I can go figure out if it is something that would be useful to them because it's not for everyone. And when you, when you are kind of vetting those opportunities, I guess, um, if you determine that maybe there's not going to be an opportunity for follow-up or for that relationship building, um, what, what do you do then as the clinician? What is appropriate in that situation? I think if there is no intention of doing music therapy either with them before or after, I think it is 100% okay to just record a heartbeat and give that to them as just almost as a gift to be like with even the, the language of this is another way for them to say, I love you right now. Mm. And that can be it. And it takes five seconds to record. You can loop it or it can just be that little chunk of their literal heart rate that has its, you know, variables to sure. it. And, and then we can even print out um, a visual of that that could be turned into a piece of artwork. So, I mean, there's things that we can do quickly that are still legacy building, you know, interventions, but don't take all of the time with the music therapy part right. if that's never going to happen. So then a clinician should never have to feel like they're just going to quickly figure out a song that's important to that person and then whip up a weird version of it back in their office just to give to them to me, it's just as important or equally as used if it's just that heartbeat sound. Yeah. Yeah. And then if, if there are little people involved, you can put that into a little disc that goes into a Build-A-Bear, like, for instance, if, if it's their parent. And then if it's for an older person or even an older, you know, child of the patient, you could get like a favorite T-shirt and then make a pillow out of it in the shape of a heart 
and then put that in there that's more to me age appropriate and not like you're bringing your your dad out of the hospital inside of a, a teddy bear which can be to me incongruent and kind of strange yeah you know there is still that therapeutic consideration <laughs> for stages of grief age appropriateness of intervention all of all of that yes. thought still it's still very intentional what you're doing yes but it doesn't have to be the music doesn't have to be introduced if it's not going to be a part of it if it hasn't already been a part of it right and if it is intensive care there's not a lot of bereavement follow-up so if that is not a part of your job responsibility or that you're even could have you know the luxury of following up with someone in bereavement like that i don't think that it's it it's not the same yeah and and yeah. two i wonder if i mean the first time that i heard you explain your process in that way um kind of blew my mind and and i had to think through it and kind of mull over it a little bit and i thought and as actually i've as i've been in my own graduate studies and kind of reading a lot of uh, Kenneth Brucia and just exploring like more music centered approaches and what is music? What is sound as music therapists? We are therapists of sound and that can mean a lot of different things. And so it, I had kind of a light bulb moment just in my own thoughts and thinking about even providing just the heartbeat without the music therapy is still well within our wheelhouse and appropriateness for us to be the ones to do it one logistically we've already got the equipment if we're doing this type of work but two i mean it's heartbeats are still the most essential rhythm of life and that is mm -hmm. that is something that we can educate and advocate for for our, our patients and our our clients exactly and that we don't have to be the sole provider of it right. so i've taught child life specialist in in both hospitals that I've worked in in the last number of years how to do this because there's more of them than me yeah and they work, and sometimes they work second shift or third shift so not everyone could even have this offered to them so to me it's still okay for everyone to have it offered if it's something that would mean something but that still has to be assessed by the person providing sure. it sure like they still have to have an explanation of why it is that we're doing this. Yeah. But then once that's agreed upon and they want it, then I feel like a child life specialist that has the same equipment can record and edit quickly and make a, you know, an emailed MP3 ready to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's just spreading. It's spreading, in my opinion, spreading the love a little bit in a larger net they can reach as many people as possible. So yeah, I feel like there's a strange ownership that I feel like since it is us that, that does a lot of it and we don't want to give away our goods to everyone, we don't want to you know work ourselves out of a job. But to me, this is just a different way that we can explain it to all of our ancillary colleagues in inter you know, disciplinary care to really invite this as a, a legacy intervention absolutely but i think also <laughs> yeah and i think that too adds value to the articles that you're writing and the work that you're doing with by defining what acpr is and making that distinction between this as a music therapy modality or intervention that's that's what makes it music therapy it's the therapy part it's the follow-up it's the relationship it is the music and the therapeutic relationship is a foundation that can help garner movement through that grief and bereavement therapy process like that is very much music therapy that is what it is but also um this doesn't just have to be our thing and this can still be so meaningful in a way that we can still be advocating for music therapy but also sharing this incredible resource that we don't own no yeah exactly and then yeah the artwork that can happen out of the sound waves that the art therapist could you know oh my really gosh yeah need a champion for I mean, so to me, it's 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 involving everyone in a, a beautiful way to make something that is quite unique to each family, and it should be very individualized. Not everybody needs all of it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's so cool. 
Now, one thing that um, you had also mentioned in our last conversation was what that follow-up process can look like. I believe also that you were writing a little bit about that too and had an article coming out with a story that you had done. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, Claire Getty, who works uh, at the University of Bergen in Norway, and I've been writing a paper with the first video that we celebrated this work with back at Cincinnati Children's. So if if you YouTube that first kind of example of this work, um, it's using all the thoughts and action-based research from this parent. So it's it's a a wonderful music therapist that does wonderful research that's helping organize the paper. It's using the work that I physically did with this person. And then it's getting the perspective directly from him. So he's he's one of the authors too. So there's three of us that worked on this paper that really is a, a qualitative case study that shows how you can start this at one point and all of the ways that it can continue to be that reason to reach out to them on a monthly basis. And during that time, he would come up with a new song or hear a new song that was feeling right to him. So then we would add that to the piece of music. So it started in one place where it was directly, you know, right after the death of his son, and then continued to work month by month for an entire year. Wow. And the piece of music became around 19 minutes long, where at the end, you know, looking back at the songs that he chose that were important to them, to him and to his son and to other parts of his family, that it it created this thing that became a ritual for him to walk to the cemetery, to put his phone on top of the headstone, to feel like he's connecting with his deceased son but also moving, you know, he's walking and then he walked back and then he'd go to work. And it was this morning routine he had for a long time. Mm. And it got to a place where he found a song that was geared towards closure and letting go. And he wanted to sing that part. So we created kind of a finale-ish part of it that he was able on and it happened to be the the birthday the first birthday after he had passed away to really kind of celebrate his current relationship with his son and wow. to celebrate his life in a way that felt like a finale in some ways but it took a long time to get there and it took you know following him down the peaks and valleys of his grief and that it it's okay to even just go to different parts of the recording, depending on the mood that he was in. It wouldn't have to be everything in its entirety every time, but to know that it's there. And I think at this point, you know, going back to just the sound of the heartbeat, I would still interact with him just even throughout the years as we started to create this, this very long case study. Um, and I really feel like he would give me insights on how he was currently using it even years later. So we did this, I think at this point, it's seven or eight years ago. And his relationship with it now continues to evolve with it. And sometimes he just wants to hear the heartbeat. Sometimes he'll just have the heartbeat recording that, in my opinion, is like the naked version of it. And he'll just put it on his chest. And just have a moment just to just feel like I'm connecting with my son. Wow. To me, that's just as beautiful as all the hard work we did with the music to get to where we got, which is still changing. So, I mean, he still provides insights into how this continues to be a way to feel connected to a son, which to me is is the main the main goal of this work. Wow. That's just so powerful and beautiful and just speaks to the the power in the process and like the journey that this modality can provide and really be 
It can look like so many different things, even for one person or one family. It's not a one size fit all kind of deal. And it, it shouldn't be. And it, it takes, you know, the, the sort of, I guess, intuition and also the, the availability of the music therapist to continue to provide the support for people. So yeah. to me, it, it kind of illuminated a gap in care between intensive care death and zero follow up. So there's kind of a controversial little sentence in this paper that's kind of like, we should be offering this more proactively to a lot more people. Because just in this one, you know, version of a case, how devastated this can, you know, a sudden death can be. And that there's not a lot of follow up or support that's, you know, officially offered in any way. Right. And the only reason I was even thinking that way back then is because in our hospice arm of the hospital, if you were involved in that, you got up to two years of bereavement support after your person passed away. So in my opinion, I was like, why? Just because they're involved in this program, um, it's tremendous and almost unbelievable that they get this offering of two years of support post-death. Yeah. But these other people that I'm working with don't have any. So I just sort of inserted myself without asking permission by anyone to do it. So. In my, it was my evidence that I had seen with my own eyes that I can also be helpful in this part too. And that's why it was important to write this paper as well, to show that not only that this is possible, but that we need to continue to be brave to go down avenues that aren't paved yet, to kind of cut our own pathways with the evidence and experience of doing this for 18 years that you can do things like we should with any creative arts or any kind of musician or anyone that we're kind of pushing the envelope that we're not being safe that we're doing whatever we can once we know that it can be done mm, absolutely Ooh, it's getting me fired up <laughs> it's making me yeah. want to do something crazy <laughs> but but productive productive crazy yes but I am curious for any music therapist that um, will be listening to this and is also feeling fired up like, man, maybe they are in a hospital or a hospice system. Maybe they are currently offering heartbeat recordings or maybe they're not and they want to, but they don't know how to get started or they don't know how to take this approach to the next level. What is your recommendation on where they should go or maybe how? to get started? So I think to get started with the most affordable version of this, I feel like most people have access to an iPad or some sort of tablet that could have some sort of preferred recording software. So whatever you could be using with any of your patients, whatever your preferred system is, or your digital audio workstation preference, you can use and it can be as fancy and complicated as pro tools and it can be all the way as dumbed down as garage band which comes pretty stock on apple products mm -hmm. now if you're a pc person i feel like there also are recording programs that if you're already using use that if you're working with pediatric patients you can ask one of your favorite nurses or doctors if they have an old stethoscope and it should be a real one like a nice one that's like a litman or like a really you know name brand good one now, if you want to make an omelet, you got to crack some eggs. So you got to cut that tubing. And then you can find any preferred, I like to think of any lavalier mic that you would use for recording your voice for anything. Um, a lot of them say that they're for podcast or for whatever. But as long as it, your device picks it up as a microphone, you put it inside that tubing and then you give it a few taps. Once you see that it's active and working, try it out on yourself. See if you can find some sort of almost like it looks like a heart monitor. And that's what you're looking for. So that's yeah. to me, that's the easiest way to get started. But you had to try on yourself. And you have to try it on people that maybe like you have a little niece or a cousin 
or, you know, if you do have a kid, um, to me, the, the space between the outside of their body and where their heart is, is pretty close. So that's why this version is an easy way to do it at first, because there's not much, I guess, room for error. The bigger people get, and even going back to, you know, larger adults are any woman that has large chest, there's different, there's more skin between where the heart is pushing up against that stethoscope. So it's going to be a fainter sound. So then I would recommend one of the digital stethoscopes. I love the Think Labs one. Yep. And it comes with a few different little attachments that you might need, but you can amplify it from the source. You can also listen to it while you're recording. And to me, that's very useful to, to feel like you can do all of it on your own versus needing to get a nurse or someone to find where the heartbeat. Now, if you're working with someone that is in critical care, they do have a lot of other monitors on them. And right where you need to be might have one of the little, you know, stickies, electrodes that go to all the machines that they're on. So then you can ask nursing, you know, to, to ship things around if you can. Um, but to me, your comfort level of being able to execute this quickly and confidently is the most important. So there mm -hmm. should be a lot of practice either on yourself or with someone else before you actually offer it to a real patient in real time. So yeah, I think once you do that, you can edit it in a million different ways. You can do one heartbeat and then sample that. And then you can punch that in with a MIDI controller over any piece of music. And by you, I mean them. You can have it set up to where the, the family member could add their loved one's heartbeat under the song. Because then it's theirs. Mm -hmm. It's their recording. It's not yeah. our recording. We can help them get started, but I feel like it's more meaningful to them if they do it. Now, when you're editing the heartbeat, like if you wanted to loop it to make just sort of a basic rhythmic pattern underneath of a piece of music that you're intending to create or recreate, it should be with as much participation and guidance from the intended listener. So when you're editing that heartbeat, do it in front of them so that they can hear what is most preferable to them. These are also conversations that you can have that have to do with what kind of device are they going to be listening to it on. If they're only going to be listening to it out loud on their phone without headphones, you want to make the sound of the heartbeat in that mid-range so that you can hear it. You don't want it too subsonic to where you need headphones or fancy speakers or in your car. You don't want it to be too high so it doesn't sound like a heartbeat. So, but these are things that you can talk to. And, you know, if I'm working with adults, some of them might be hard of hearing. So I might really want to crank it up in like almost a, a way that would not be as preferable to me. But that's not the point. I'm there. It's accessible to, sort of, to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want it to be as functional and useful to them as possible. So that's where these conversations come in. And also going back to like, how, how do they want it? Like, do they want it? Do they have a flip phone? Do they not have an email address? Do they want it on a compact disc? Uh, I had a patient not too long ago ask if I could put it on a cassette tape for his truck. And so, I mean, you, it, there's no reason to be doing this work if it's going to be stuck on a, uh, your own device. So how do we deliver it to them is just as important. And that also goes with conversation. So then again, the more involved they are in this, the more useful it will be to them going forward. And then do you have any recommendations on how to maybe introduce the follow-up part of the therapy process? I think the follow-up can be, you know, and done in a lot of different ways. It can, some people, you can assess, you know, you can even ask them, do you, would you like me to call you in a month? You know, so it, I don't think surprise therapy is ever a good thing. So the more, I guess, in involvement or preparation they have to think it, think it over. And it can be like, hey, you don't even have to answer right now. How about I call you back in a month or two and just check in with you? Mm, and yeah. it just sort of lets them know that the lights are on. 
Our arms are open. We're open for business when you're ready. If you're not ready, we can wait. There's no rush. If, yeah. You know, there's people that I've talked to a year later that are finally ready to do something with it or not, but appreciate the call that lets them know that I'm almost like a, a, a face of the hospital that's saying, hey, we haven't forgotten about you and you're mm-hmm. still important and we're still worrying about you and wondering if you're doing okay. And if there's mm-hmm. anything we can do to be helpful, it'd be as simple as that. A 30 second conversation might kind of mean the world to someone that was not, again, expecting to hear from someone like me. It's a way to feel connected. Um, if they do want to do something, you know, I often, you know, I kind of put the same parameters of two years if they need something. And we can even set up an outpatient now that, you know, COVID is a little bit more understood. They can come in and we can have a session and work on it or talk about it at least. Yeah. So, it, but it should be individualized and it should be assessed whether this is annoying to them because we don't want to annoy them. So there, there is a delicate dance between not wanting to ruin their day by talking about the worst thing that happened to them and more of checking in with them as a proactive resource to let them know that we're still thinking about them. Yeah. And offers that support. Yeah. And it can be very casual and they could even be emailed and they might say, Oh, you know what? I heard this song and it, it made me think of this vacation that we went on. You know, is it possible that we could just add a little part of that at the end of it? Because I think then it's moving in a way that instead of it being this other version of it that they've been listening to, it's adding a new life to it that, brings about a new memory and a new thought. Yeah, and going back to other voice recordings that I do with people, the more time that we have to talk about some of this stuff, the further we can go down the line of talking about, you know, say that they're in their 60s and they have adult children, but they might not be around for their graduation from college or their wedding or the birth of their kids. So we can start to talk about some of this and they could leave a graduation message. They can talk about what they might, you know, give as advice on their wedding day. They can give that speech that they wanted to give them for just sort of general life advice. They could read a book that's intended for their not yet made grandbaby. Um, So I feel like the more proactivity we have surrounding this provides a positive energy around something that is going to happen to all of us, which, you know, to, to quote Neil deGrasse Tyson, if the world never ended, if your world never ended, nothing matters. Mm -hmm. You can do it all tomorrow. You know, I'll say, I love you tomorrow, but the finite aspect of living makes things important. So these things become more meaningful because it's with intention and that we're not going to be here one day. So if we can proactively create some good energy surrounding just the fact that we're going to die, I feel like that's when some of the real magic can happen. And that's when your fear of death changes and you transform that into a celebration of living because Mm -hmm. today is actually the most important day of our lives and who who cares what happens tomorrow but if we have some time to think about tomorrow let's do a little recording surrounding it and i think i'm i'm using my clinical evidence of just doing this for so long that i know they're going to feel better after they do it because it's going to be there for them yeah and for their family yeah yeah that's That's so empowering for them. And I can just imagine if I might say also just incredibly profound for you as a human and as a therapist getting to do this kind of work in these really vulnerable and like such human moments with people. It's incredible. And it can't happen without that relationship that you can quickly and profoundly build with them. They have to know immediately that you are one of their champions, that you're an advocate for them, that you're only there to help. And you might have some things that might feel challenging to bring up, but I guarantee you, I'm going to walk with you the whole time. I'm going to jump right there in the water with you. And instead of letting those waves hit us, we're going to figure out a way to swim. 
and keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now I have one last question um, to just kind of wrap up this conversation, which has just been so incredible. So thank you again for sharing everything that you've shared. But I want to ask too, because speaking about the human aspect and um, I would be remiss to not acknowledge the heaviness that your work would bring also because you are working with and you have worked with a lot of people who are dying and that's a really difficult um, kind of emotional burden that we as therapists have the opportunity to bear and to work through for ourselves. So what keeps you moving forward and what keeps you inspired to do this kind of work? I think it comes back to everything that I can learn from these people. So in some capacity, I'm always kind of going back and forth in my mind between what would I want if I were them, what would be annoying to me if I were them being me. So still kind of dancing this delicate dance, but also not being afraid. And I feel like that that lack of, of fear kind of fills this f- interesting confidence that makes them feel comfortable and learning from them, knowing that one day I could very well be in their exact situation provides me with life that I'm, I might not only be there one day, but how will I react when I'm there that day? And thinking about that all day long makes me less afraid of that day Mm -hmm. because I'm learning through these people all day long of how things could be and might be never should be, but I get to witness and observe and participate in their lives in a way that makes me feel alive. So I'm, I'm not a a fan of prolonged um, care that, that really, you know, allows for a lot of suffering to happen. So if there is a lot of language that surrounds cancer care, that's about beating and fighting and wars and, but in those analogies, there's a winner and a loser. And I never want anyone to feel like they're losing. Mm. So there's a celebration that I feel like I at least have in a force behind all of the work that I'm doing that we are celebrating something today, whether it's the fact that you sat up in your bed, whether it's the fact that you brushed your teeth and don't feel gross right now, whether it's finding a wig or a hat that makes you feel a little bit more beautiful today, whether it's just saying out loud, man, you look beautiful today. (laughs) <laughs> and, and so to me, those are the, the parts that I'm focusing on that help me keep moving, that that's my, my job versus to be worrying about all of the other horrible parts that they're feeling all the time. To me, it's my job to shine a light in the dark to say, hey, you're gorgeous. We're going to figure out something to do today and hopefully get you moving. And maybe you might even stand up and try to dance with me a little bit. Or maybe, you know, we're just going to have a different feeling about talking about things because, you know what, I'm tired of feeling mad about it it all. So Mm. you can give it all to me, but we're going to move somewhere. And to me, that keeps me going. Mm. I think if I let it stay with me and I focus on all the dark parts and the doom and gloom, I like to, to really turn that rose colored glass on of an outlook that is I'm doing whatever I can to be helpful. And to me, that makes me feel good. And if we went somewhere that was just a little bit different than how I found you, there it is. And that that's, that's all I'm looking at. And I'm glad when they're, you know, sometimes when they do die and they've had a a horrible last three years, I'm glad that they're not suffering anymore. And I'm glad yeah. that they can kind of let go of this vehicle that, that made them feel all the things that they felt and celebrate their life that, man, that was hard and you're free now. So to me, that's yeah. the, the keeping moving that, that doesn't ever keep me stuck in any way. It's not only that you are helping your, your patients move, but that you also, as part of that relationship, because you can't have um, a patient without 
also being the therapist, right? Like there's two of you in that relationship and it's not Mm -hmm. only just helping them move, it's also helping you move and then moving together. Yes. And I think that's what makes a good therapist. You, You still have to be a human being and you still do have these strong connections. And I do very much when I'm doing these recordings and editing with them, I feel their life around me too. And if I hear that song that was important to them on the radio, it doesn't make me sad. It makes me be like, oh, man. And then, like, it's almost like I'm giving a cheers out into the world, like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's how I feel. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. But it is tough. It takes a long time to figure these things out. And I still am. I've not figured it out yet. Well, I think that's what it means to be human. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate all of your time and and sharing your experiences. And I can't wait to get this conversation to people so that they can hear more of what you're doing. So thank you. I'm grateful for this opportunity. For show notes and resources in today's episode and all episodes, head to our website, musictherapyandbeyond.com. Reach out to us at musictherapyandbeyond at gmail.com and follow us on social media to stay up to date on all the content and announcements. We'll see you next time. Thank you.